All right, so that's 2 Timothy. So we're gonna, we now completed that part of uh, Heart of the Matters. That's part 60. You'll be on a Heart of the Matter fast for the next three weeks or two weeks until I come back. But I hope that we're understanding that we're really not... Um, how do I want to say this? Do you remember the teaching I did on unity and division in the body? And I've also talked about it in developing the character of Yeshua. There, there's, I called it phases in one point. I called it paradigm shifts in another point. The idea of we go through this cycle. And in the cycle, we go from, you know, maybe not knowing there was even a creator to knowing there's a creator to realizing there's a Messiah, then realizing Torah is relevant, and then making the mechanical changes. But the last piece of that puzzle is the growing up, the maturing. And what you see out there is a body that is absolutely stagnant in immaturity. I'm talking to myself first. I'm still struggling with almost all that leadership stuff in there, patient and all this. You know, I've got all those issues. But that's the problem, is that we're not focusing enough attention on that. We still are focusing on trying to figure out how to s- pronounce the name. Huh. Put, if you would only put that same effort into becoming grown up, where would we be? Or trying to figure out the shape of the earth. <laughs> okay? I don't care if it's flat or round. I want you to be walking on it maturely, whatever shape it is. Because figuring it out, I promise you, is not going to get you the crown. Now, if it's important to you to figure it out, good. Figure it out, get it done with, and move on. But let's grow up. And I'm not saying that if you think it's round or flat, you're not growing up. I think if you're focusing all your attention on that, you're not focused on the things that will help you to grow up. How do you treat each other and how do you treat him? I know you focus a lot on how to treat him. We don't, don't do very much about focusing on how we treat each other. Very few of us can go up to very few of us and genuinely say, I love you, to a brother, to a sister. A lot of us struggle to do that with actually family members, husbands, wives, kids, whatever. We don't, you know, to really say it and mean it. Because we're not, we have too many issues. We're too broken. We're too damaged. And here I am going into the second sermon. <laughs> All right, if you've got comments or questions, I don't know. I'm just fired up about the teaching, I guess. And, you know, I look out there, and when I talk to other teachers, everybody's dealing with the same issue. The issue of the body is just absolutely, I call it hell-bent on sitting in its diaper, sucking its thumb. But every single one of them thinks they're in a three-piece suit or a long dress and fully mature, and everybody else is sitting in the diaper sucking their thumb, except for them. But they see themselves as, you know, all together. Let me just jump in real quickly because there are people out there that will not have heard what Rabbi Tom said correctly, and part of it is this. It says proclaim the word and reprove. Those words come in there are correct. Just understand again, this is a letter to a teacher about other teachers and himself. It is not an instruction that tells you you have now the job to go out there and proclaim the word with urgency and reprove people and warn people. That is the role that only some people have. But if you don't understand, see, somebody will read this verse and claim that verse and walk in that verse, not understanding that this letter was not written to the lay person. Okay? It's not everybody's job to go out and correct and reprove. Yes, the verse says it. But remember, this is talking about teachers, and it continues saying, you need to do this because there's going to come a time when they, who? The they that are not doing the reproving the people who are supposed to be listening to the teachers, will no longer bear sound teaching. So just let's remember that chapter 4 is still part of the same letter to a teacher about going out and training other teachers. Is it making sense? Are we fair with that? Because others will take this and think it's their job now to go out there and reprove and correct and warn everybody. That's not your job. 
Work on your job. You know what your job is? To learn how to become Yeshua-like. Grow up. I'm not saying that in a condescending way. I'm talking to myself. We need to grow up. You know, I wrote a little note to myself many, many months ago, and I found it going through some papers the other day, and it said, when you are offended, it simply means that you were not yet mature enough to handle what just happened. Think about that for a minute. If you are offended, it means that you are not yet mature enough to handle what just happened. See, most of us are not there yet. See, because nothing should offend you. But we're offended because we're not mature enough to handle correctly what happens. And it's that offense that gets us to be all vicious and angry and lash out and fight and all this stuff because we get offended. I get, we get offended by what others believe, what they do, what they say, how they look. It doesn't matter, but we get offended. We take it, in other words, by offended I mean you take it as a personal offense. Like it was done to you. And so maybe that's something we need, to, I think we need to start making these things that we can have people print out on their computer and make these little things with a nice pretty background that says, you know, if you are offended, it simply means that you are not yet mature enough to handle what just happened. Is that fair? Okay. I think that fits right into this. And it just so happens that, you know how you have piles of papers? At least, I don't know, maybe you don't. I do. I've got piles of papers everywhere. And I'm trying to clean through them and put them away, and I found that little piece of paper. I scribbled on it because the Ruach will give me these things every now and then. At night, I'll scribble it down on a paper. I'm, I'm, I'm flying on a plane. I just might write something down. Wherever I am, and it, something happened, and it, it, just, it just hit me. When you act offended, when you take that offense, it's because you're not mature enough yet to handle what happened. Because if you were mature enough, you wouldn't be offended you just handle it. Because it might be a right way to handle it, but instead you're offended. And because you're offended, you handle it completely differently. What would you say to the idea that Father is actually in a season of winnowing right now? That he's in a season where those who want to be righteous are growing in righteousness and those who refuse the yoke of Messiah through his anointed appointeds are getting worse and worse. You know, we, we try very hard not to step in the role of trying to understand why people do what they do and uh, label it in any way. You know, there's been, um, there was a season, and I think that's, it's, it's kind of matches the agricultural model is that, you know, we had a season of growth, then we had a season of, of a lot of fruit, and then a lot of the, some of the fruit you know, fell off the tree, so to speak. And, um, you know, now we've had very little turnover in a very long time. I mean, really, the congregation has not changed very much, probably in over two years. Although there was a lot of turnover in the first two years. And the same thing with the MTOI structure and leadership. We've had the same uh, guys in the leadership, uh, except for a few that are new, but we haven't had hardly anybody leave in several years. And so there is a solidifying, a commitment, a dedication, which is why we've been talking about it quite a bit. And by the way, if you see me doing these type of things, I want to make sure that all the Illuminatis out there are reading my hand signals correctly. I still, the people are still getting online going, he's doing Illuminati hand signals. No, I just, I'm Jewish. I talk with my hands. Jews, Italians, we talk with our hands. Okay, so... And so I just want to make sure as I'm doing this that I've covered every possible secret message, you know, thing that's out there. You think I'm making this up. I'm not making this up. The live stream guys will tell you that this is like a regular issue that comes up. How come he's doing Illuminati? Did Listen, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, okay? All right? What do I know? I move my hands. And as I'm moving them, maybe it does whatever it is you think I'm doing, but I'm not doing it with any understanding of what you think. Here's the thing, okay? I think that that's the way Abba works. He, he has growth, then there's pruning, then there's growth, then there's pruning. And we're going through a growth spurt, but we have a new solid base that we're building on. 
And so that's kind of how it works is that as this pruning goes, each time we have a stronger, more solid base. And that's really what's happening, you know. It's like you got to shake the tree so that's, you know, whatever's not hanging on tight falls out. Okay, and so that's what he does from time to time. So he'll shake that tree. But we really haven't had hardly any turnover at all in quite a while because we're down now to the people that are here or people that are moving here because this is where they know this is where they want to be. Not coming because they're not sure it's where they want to be or checking it out. You guys aren't checking it out anymore. You understand the difference? You know, you're, you've gotten past the checking out phase and you've come to say, you know what? This is my home. This is my family. I'm committed and dedicated to this group of people to love on them and be loved by them and to receive and to give and all those kind of things. So I think we're going through that season now. Yeah, I think what basically Trish is trying to say is that it's not that she's <clears throat> starting to learn how to compromise at all, but to have balance and perspective. Okay, a more balanced perspective. Because, you know, you may have very clear boundaries in your own personal life, but someone crossing one of those boundaries <clears throat> may be doing it completely, not having any idea that they crossed the boundary. And if you pointed it out to them in a gentle way, be very happy to step back on the other side of the boundary. And where in the past, you may have put that boundary there because the people that crossed over that boundary could care less that you had a boundary and just felt like crossing it any time they wanted to. And so you just decided to have a hard and fast boundary instead of realizing that boundary, if someone crosses it, it may not be dangerous. You need to find out more information. Maybe it's something you could just encourage. You just have a little conversation with the person, and next thing you know, everything's okay again. Or it may be that the person could care less that you have a boundary, and that is somebody you need to keep at a distance. But you need to know which is which, and not just assume that everybody that crosses a personal boundary is actually a problem. <clears throat> Okay, and so I'm helping, I'm helping. But now what she then was saying was that she's now struggling with one of her family members who she taught too well. Because that family member is now doing exactly that to her. Made a very hard and, you know, hard and fast boundary. Believes that Trisha crossed that boundary and now there's no fixing it. Because the way she had had the boundaries in the past was once you cross that boundary, you're done. Okay, because you're now showing me you're not safe and I can't be trusted. And see, and we have to be careful with that. Because somebody may cross a boundary, and if you point it out to them very quickly and very contritely say, I'm so sorry, I will never do that again. I didn't realize that was a boundary in your... Because we all have our own boundaries. And what may be okay with me may not be okay with Robert or vice versa because we all have our own different, you know, personal boundaries. And I'm not talking about the things that's obvious to everybody. Okay? I'm talking about just you have your own personal space issues and whatever it is and the way you like to be treated and just you have your own ways of doing things. And so I think the mature person, which is kind of what Trish is getting to, is the person who's going to first seek to understand, is this person aware of the boundary? Is this person doing it because they don't care about the boundary? If I share this with the person, will they now respect the boundary? I mean, there's so many different ways now to handle it. Is that making sense to everyone? And we all do this because we, we read into the other person the motivation that we think they, they have driving why they did what they did. And guess what? Probably a good chunk of the time, you got it wrong. They did not have the motivation you thought. And when I say good chunk, I don't know, 30, 40%, maybe more. But after all, in the past, when someone had done that, it was really bad, and so you want to be safe, so you put the boundary up there. Well, that may have been the exception, not the rule, but you made a rule based on the exception. Is there a connection between 2 Timothy 2.18 and Matthew 27, where it says, after Yeshua's resurrection, many came out of their graves and appeared to many? I think it has more to do with the fact that Paul saw him, the apostles saw him after he was resurrected, and so that's well known as part of the message of the testimonies that they're giving. And they're saying, look, he's already been resurrected. The resurrection's already taken place. And here, you know, the message is, but he's coming back. And there are those that are denying that. Because after all, the first century 
uh, believers all believed it was going to happen in their lifetime. And it was getting longer and longer and hadn't happened. I mean, even when they saw him, and we see this even in Acts chapter 1, they said, are you going to set up the kingdom now? And he's like, no, not now. <laughs> not yet. Not until you go out there and get this word out to the lost tribes and go to all the cities of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, I mean, we, we're speculating because we really don't know why Paul is addressing this. Obviously, this is a thing that Timothy understood that was going on. But the bigger part of the message, you know, was just the idea that this is a teacher, Shaul, teaching a student who is also a teacher about going out and training more students to be teachers and having them understand the correct heart and approach and behavior as a teacher. I've told all my kids, my kids, my goal is they're better than I am. My goal is that I have to end up learning from them later. It's not about being better than somebody. It's about doing our role and it's about looking to those people who have that knowledge and experience that we don't have and learning. Hopefully that helps somebody because I know there's always a lot of flack about that, that, that role that, that yeah. somehow elevates. You know, it's definitely not about elevating, but you know what, what we're trying to talk about also is that, you know, Robert has told me many times about opportunities where, you know, he worked in juvenile probation and sometimes, uh, you know, one of the juveniles will do something and he will say to them, if you do that again, you're going right back to the prison and we're taking you right to the judge. And the child will then look at him and say, well, you can't do that. He says, no, actually, I can. In other words, understanding that positions do have limited specific authority. Let's call it that. All right. Okay. When I got married, I had limited specific authority with my wife. And then we had children and now I have limited specific authority with my children. Okay, you see what I'm saying? And if you have a job, say you're a supervisor or a manager in a business, you have limited specific authority in that place. And so here, Timothy is being taught about this idea of being a teacher, but understand that that teacher has limited specific authority in a role, where outside of that role, there isn't any authority because you're outside of that role. Okay, so that's, the body is suffering because there's a complete backlash against every kind of authority, no matter what the role or what limited specific authority there may be. Because it's so easy to just say, well, I just follow Yeshua, because that basically, since he's not here standing right in front of you, means that you get to decide whatever you want to get to decide that it comes out of Yeshua, you know? You know, there was a line we were watching last night, as we often do, we watch, you know, some of the Bible movies and stuff. We were watching what I, what I have dubbed the Angry Moses. <laughs> it's one of the many versions of the Moses movie, but this is one where he clearly has an anger problem and, and, and knows it. And there's one line where he's talking to Pharaoh, you know, and, uh, you know, he says to Pharaoh something, and Pharaoh says, says uh, something back to him, and he goes, he goes, um, he says, well, no, he says, uh, I'm not the one that did that. God did that. He says, but God speaks through me. In other words, understand this is my limited specific authority here with you, Pharaoh. Okay? And so that is the kind of message I thought, I said, how, how, how powerful that is for him to be able to look at the man and I says, yes, you know, this isn't me. I'm not the one doing this. God's doing it, but he happens to be speaking through me. And I, I, I'm sure that many of the prophets wish they could have been stronger in being able to say that to people and actually have people believe them because we killed all the prophets because we didn't want to believe them. Well, not all of them, but most of them, okay? A few of them escaped <laughs> without getting killed. But the idea being they were not accepted readily as, but he speaks through me. We all have to be looking for those people that have that limited, specific authority to teach, to lead, to whatever it is that, that, that Abba's given them to do because he's speaking through them on that limited, targeted level. Does that make any sense? So I'm not claiming that a teacher is like a prophet or some other thing, but he's been given a gifting and a talent just like the limited, targeted, specific talents that you see in the people that are singing and playing instruments. 
or cooking and providing tremendously delicious food, or doing the, the designing of the electronics that we all benefit from, like this microphone and the cameras. I mean, we have people that are terrific at different things, and then they're able to then teach and train others to do what they do who also have talent. Does that make any sense? But we don't just allow anybody that thinks they know how to put a computer together to just go ahead and put a computer together. It has to work. It has to, you know what I'm saying? You have to show and demonstrate you have the gifts and the talents. And so we should want that. I mean, you don't want anybody doing, when you walk into a medical office, do you want somebody that has a, uh, you know, a law degree? Or do you want a, someone who has a doctor's degree? Now, by the way, you're walking into a pediatrician's office. Now, do you want someone who's an orthopedic surgeon or do you want someone actually who's specialized in pediatrics? Do you understand what I'm trying to show you? So if you're looking for understanding this book, you might want to find someone who's been given a limited, targeted, specific training, authority, gifting to teach you about what's in this book. Now, just hopefully that makes some sense. But just realize, the more we're trying to get that out there, the more the backlash. Not just against me, but against it in general. There should not be organization and structure and leadership and all those kind of things. Look at how it's been working so well for the last 2,000 years. I mean, no organization, no structure. And because of it, the movement has disappeared and reappeared so many times over 2,000 years because it's never been organized enough to stay cohesively together, to be visible and functional. Don't you think it's about time we made a change? And so we're presenting an opportunity for change. Hopefully it's for the better. What is a good start for someone who, through their life, has become distrustful of others around them in regards of being gentle and kind towards others? Again, it, it, this is what we call the maturing process. Maturity, by the way, is not fun. It's not easy. It's usually a challenging process. It asks you to stretch beyond your comfort zone and beyond your default. In other words, what you would naturally do by default. So when you're, you know, when you're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, we take something like love. All right, well, all of us hopefully understand that on some level. We have loved and been loved to some degree, but what about the Ruach level, like loving your enemy? See, that's not something that you naturally would understand. It stretches you, it asks you to go beyond. Same thing, Samuel, with what you're asking. You know, people that are, are, have given you this sense of not trusting them and, and, and not counting on them or, or being, you know, uh, cautious because of, of things that may have happened, well, is that going to cause you now to not trust anybody? Or can you stretch beyond to realize that that's the exception and not the rule, even though it's becoming more the rule than the exception because of the amount of uh, people that may fall into that category. But we have to learn then to move forward. Be like the person that had a problem in a relationship, quote unquote, being in love, and then having that happen more than once, and then deciding I'm never gonna fall in love again because after all, it hurt the last five times or three times, whatever it was. Um, but you have enough evidence to know that that's just not true as a universal thought. But you can stop trusting leadership because you've been under bad leadership. You can try, stop trusting people because you've only interacted with bad people. Whatever. We can all throw everything out there. This is how the enemy wins. Just have you use these global universal ways of handling things. But it takes maturity, and I'm not saying Sam, you're not mature because we're all not, okay? But maturity is as we grow and stretch beyond our natural inclinations to choose to be a certain way instead of just naturally being a certain way, that's as we grow into maturity. Does that make any sense? How should I respond to parents who are ignorant or lie to me? Listen, as long as you're in your parents' house, you have to simply make the best adjustments you can to, to get successfully through that period of life. If your parents are lying to you or, what was the other part? Well, you put who, who are ignorant and lie. Well, ignorant meaning, you know, they, they, they don't understand the, the, the truth and the way things are and they're lying to you. Um, take that understanding that you have and try to function as functionally as you can until you are old enough to leave. You're not supposed to stay in your parents' house forever. So until you get there, work in 
the understanding. In other words, we're told even in the husband-wife thing to dwell with understanding. Well, dwell with your parents with understanding. If you know they lie to you, then be cautious about what they say and how you handle it. But you have to still be respectful and honor them as your parents. That doesn't mean you have to obey and do every single thing they say. It simply means make sure that you're being respectful and honoring them as parents. But at the same time, being careful to not be in harm's way because they're lying or in their ignorance put you in harm's way. It's something that you're more than welcome to counsel directly about. It's, like, it's very hard without specifics, okay? But you certainly can counsel about that. But my main encouragement to anyone that's a child in a person's house, and I'm assuming that you're at least a teenager in a parent's house, if not older, uh, the idea being to survive through that period and then to leave when you can, okay? Because your parents will be a lot easier to deal with from a distance than from in the same house. Because now you can deal with them adult to adult, as opposed to child under their roof. Does walking in covenant seem to prepare us for approaching others properly? Well, since it corrects, rebukes, and teaches us? Um, if you're walking in covenant, Abba's going to correct you. It says that he corrects those he loves. So he will correct you, and he will do that through others, or he'll do it through you know, himself putting you through circumstances where you realize, whatever I'm doing isn't working, so there must be something I'm doing that's not right. And so you start to look for that. But just we're care we have to be careful about taking on the role of being the one doing the correcting. Okay, I would be very reluctant to step into that role. All right? And if you've ever met me personally, while I may be strong and very corrective from the microphone to, in, to the population as a whole, you know, you'll see that one-on-one, -on -one, I'm very slow to say, you're wrong here, you're wrong there. I may give you encouragement to check things out for yourself and to reevaluate or reconsider, to come to a conclusion yourself. But many of you will t should be able to attest to the fact that you very rarely, if ever, have heard me say, well, you're wrong, this, you shouldn't be doing this, this is wrong, that's wrong. I don't correct people that way.